Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss some of the recent updates about, I guess, one of the most exciting exoplanets discovered in the last couple of years. The exoplanet referred to as K218b, and exciting because of the observations from the James Webb that potentially revealed some of the first bizarre biosignatures coming from an exoplanet, possibly suggesting something alive on the surface, or maybe suggesting some bizarre chemistry. But ever since then, in the last year and a half or so, there's been a lot of additional observations and additional discoveries, and so I wanted to do a bit of a follow-up on what's happening with this exoplanet, and what most researchers believe now. But I guess first, a super brief review. First of all, this is called K218b, because this was part of the second mission by the NASA's Kepler telescope that conducted several observations around 2015. And during this time, even though it discovered a lot of exoplanets, one of them kind of stood out. And stood out because, first of all, it was in the habitable zone of the star system, and because its overall size suggested a potential terrestrial planet. But the additional observations revealed that this was very likely either a super-Earth or a mini-Neptune. So basically here, at a distance of 111 light-years away from Earth, we had an object with approximately 8.6 masses of planet Earth, and at least 2.5 times larger. But because the orbit here was 33 days, this was definitely in the middle of the habitable zone of this star system, with the average temperature potentially being slightly less than on planet Earth. Assuming this planet had no atmosphere, it would be about minus 8 degrees Celsius, but because of the atmosphere, it would be obviously much higher. But it was also discovered that this planet very likely has a much lower density than planet Earth, but much higher than Neptune. It was actually about 2.67 gram per centimeter cube, which was actually right between Neptune and planet Earth. And here this suggested some kind of a terrestrial planet, very likely surrounded by a thick atmosphere. And possibly atmosphere not so different from an actual gas giant. And actually this made this planet super exciting. With many additional investigations following for years after that. And the first one was obviously by the Hubble Space Telescope. Here initially Hubble seemed to reveal water vapor, which was already super exciting. With some of the first observations from the James Webb revealing carbon dioxide, and methane. And this would make this a really intriguing world with potentially enriched atmosphere, but also potentially an ocean on the surface. And this made this planet one of the first members of the hypothetical Hycean planet group, a type of terrestrial exoplanets surrounded by a very thick hydrogen atmosphere, but also containing liquid water ocean on the surface, very likely enriched in hydrogen, and also very likely somewhat hot. You can learn more about this concept in one of the previous videos in the description. But apart from water, methane, and carbon dioxide, another study in December of 2023 revealed something else super exciting. In this study, researchers revealed carbon-bearing molecules, but specifically a molecule referred to as DMS, dimethyl sulfide. With this basically going viral because, in some sense, here, based on what we know about planet Earth, DMS seems to be mostly made by life specifically ocean life, for actually somewhat unusual reasons that once again you can learn about in one of the previous videos in the description. And so a lot of astronomers started to wonder if maybe this DMS detection could actually be signs of life, possibly first ever by signature coming from a distant planet. And since on Earth this is mostly produced by phytoplankton, being able to see it in the atmosphere of a different planet suggested that something maybe similar is going on there as well. And so mixed with the water vapor, and the detection of carbon dioxide, this was super exciting. And exciting because normally, when it comes to biosignatures, we actually do want to find some kind of a mixture. So basically just finding oxygen or just finding DMS would not really mean much. But discovering things like oxygen, methane, and for example, nitrous oxides would be a pretty big deal because it would suggest this is very likely due to life. In this case, finding carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, and DMS though not a definitive sign of life, was actually super exciting. But obviously, not a telltale sign of life, and the actual signatures and detections were not actually that strong either. In other words, these were just initial signs, and not a definitive sign of something in the atmosphere of this planet. And here it's important to discuss a few additional discoveries and a few additional cases before we basically come to any conclusions. And let's, I guess, start with Titan the moon of Saturn. Prior to the Cassini mission, a lot of initial investigations of Titan also kept discovering bizarre molecules. I mean, we already knew it has methane, but here researchers also kept discovering CO2, carbon monoxide, 
and a few other carbon molecules, in many cases in very different proportions from what's expected from natural geology. Or essentially here, the atmospheric ratios of various gases didn't make sense. And so years ago, there were actually several papers making very similar propositions for potential biosignatures and maybe life on Titan based on these observations. And though obviously life on Titan is still technically possible, this was not the detection. And that's because once we saw Enceladus, the other moon of Saturn, things became way more clear. Enceladus, as you probably know, has these massive geysers. And these geysers, or technically these cryovolcanoes, play an enormous role in the entire Saturnian system. They're actually responsible for one of the rings of Saturn, but they're also responsible for enriching some of its neighbors. And so many of these plumes that shoot out water and a lot of other organic molecules basically end up enriching Titan with a lot of its carbon monoxide. And so this chemical imbalance seems to be the result of the cryovolcanism on Enceladus. It does not seem to do anything with life. And something somewhat similar was actually proposed here as well by a different study. Now, first of all, based on some of the older studies, in this case, this is one from 1975, we already knew that it's possible to create things like DMS in completely natural conditions without life. In this study, this was actually created using hydrogen sulfide, methane, and electricity, and absolutely no life was necessary. But a much more important discovery came from November of 2024. Here, a study by Nora Honey revealed that apparently dimethyl sulfide was also detected in comets. In other words, it's not just created by marine organisms, and there are actual natural abiotic sources in outer space. Which means that DMS is definitely not a good biosignature to begin with. And since comets usually contain a lot of pristine organic molecules, it means that DMS can technically be created entirely without life. Here, we don't actually think life was responsible for the formation of DMS on the comets. In this case, this was based on the observations from the famous comet 67P, Churumov Gerasimenko, which is actually a super important discovery. Since comets are so good at enriching a lot of different planets with a lot of different compounds, and potentially even delivering a lot of water to the surface of our own planet, it would not be unusual to discover a DMS in some other star system somewhere out there, possibly delivered in the same way. So here, DMS does not require life at all. Likewise, some other studies tried to explain these bizarre chemical signatures just by the fact that this is a bizarre planet. As in because this is technically what's known as a Hycean world, mixed with a lot of other stuff, including hydrogen, that can no longer separate and creates a very strange mixture that occasionally releases certain compounds. And so this very strange hydrogen water-based homogenous liquid possibly just produces different chemistry we cannot imagine yet. Mostly because the actual experiments of this liquid have never been conducted on Earth just because it can only exist in some really extreme conditions. But a much bigger problem comes from something entirely different. And specifically from the way we actually discover all of this and from the way this light is analyzed and how we discover signs of these molecules. As you might already know, this is how it's actually done. Researchers basically look at the starlight passing through the atmosphere of the planet as it moves right in front of the star. During this passage, some of the light from the star basically creates certain absorption lines, which can then be interpreted as some kind of a molecule blocking the light. This then results in this absorption spectrum you see right here. But there's actually a problem here. A lot of this is technically guesswork. Light traveling through these molecules and the absorption it produces can technically be done by a lot of different stuff in different conditions. Or just to rephrase this, the same molecule can technically create a relatively similar absorption spectrum. And so in most cases, when scientists look at this, they actually have to make an educated guess. For example, based on the presence of something like methane, they might assume there might be some other carbon-based molecules, and thus assume that something here is, for example, carbon dioxide or dimethyl sulfide. But in reality, this data can have multiple interpretations. And so far, this has been the main criticism about the original paper. A lot of different scientists that use similar data from the James Webb Space Telescope decided to reanalyze it and actually ended up with different results. And one of the biggest such papers was just released. A comprehensive reanalysis of K218b's transmission spectrum. This is by Steven Schmidt and the international team you see right here. And here this was basically a kind of a summary of all of the different papers and all of the different techniques used to analyze this data that mostly came to a very similar conclusion. With the first conclusion being that there is indeed methane. 
and quite a lot of it. But, based on the urea analysis and the use of slightly different statistical method, researchers found no CO2, no DMS. In other words, there does not seem to be carbon dioxide here and there is definitely no signs of dimethyl sulfides. With the researchers concluding that this planet is very likely some kind of an oxygen-poor mini-Neptune and just has really thick atmosphere, very similar to Neptune, containing methane and a lot of other gases. But obviously because of higher density, it also does seem to contain a relatively large terrestrial core. And this is technically based on several studies from a group of different scientists that use different models to reanalyze this data and basically found no statistical evidence for anything like DMS. So essentially here, by using different methods, and specifically a much more thorough mathematical approach, a lot of these carbon molecules seem to completely disappear. And because in this case, mini Neptunes or sub Neptunes are actually some of the most common planets we've discovered so far, and they seem to be present in something like one fourth of all star systems discovered so far, it would not be unusual for this planet to be somewhat similar. And so the result from the study basically suggests that this is very likely some kind of a sub Neptune, also known as a gas dwarf. But we know that some of the coldest sub Neptunes technically can host liquid water oceans. And this is what we refer to as Hycean planets. So basically, there's still a slight chance that this is an exciting world and might even have a chance for life. But a lot of this would be complete guesswork and there is no evidence for anything yet. And so no signs of biosignatures can be claimed either. But the thing is, the observations are not done yet. There are going to be at least two more observations with the James Webb Space Telescope in the next few months, and we're also waiting for some additional analysis from previous observations as well. And so, for all we know, maybe K218b will turn out to be super exciting after all, following these new observations, but at least for now, it just seems to have all of the signs of a typical gas planet. Just the fact that it contains so much methane and potential signs of water vapor basically make it look exactly like Neptune just much smaller in size and much less massive. So I guess we'll just wait for future observations. And until then, check out some of the previous videos in the description about similar topics. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learn about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.